There is a story uh, that's been told for generations, both inside and outside the church, of two men. Uh, one who finds himself in this desperate state. He um, is helpless and in need of someone to show compassion. And then there's this other man who stumbles across this poor man and um, doesn't have any, he's not obliged to stop, no obligation to stop, but he does, and he shows kindness and compassion, and he cares for this poor man. And based on this really simple story, multiple organizations have started to kind of carry out this guy's mission of caring for those in need. Um, and laws have actually been put into place in order to protect the compassionate man so that if any harm was done in his attempt to help, you know, no charges could be laid. Um, and this man's name has kind of become the way that we tag people if they have followed in his example. And so if you haven't guessed this guy's name already, it's the Good Samaritan. Um, and whether it's in a, a Sunday school class or the five o'clock news, if you hear the term Good Samaritan, it means that someone has shown kindness and charity. And so because it's become this really well-known, well-understood phrase, um, I think people can speak these words and not even know the origin of them. And especially they may not even know um, the one who first told the story of the Good Samaritan. And so while the moral of the story may seem really simple, you know, be kind, be charitable, uh, the man who spoke the words was in no way simple. He was radical. And, and the message that he had to share was um, uncomfortable at times and, you know what, even offensive. Um, and so I find it difficult to believe that, that this story of the Good Samaritan was told simply to encourage kindness or charity. Um, there, I, I believe because of the author of this story that there is something more. So today, as we examine this parable of the Good Samaritan, my hope is that we don't just walk away with a better understanding of what it is to be kind to our neighbors, but we walk away with a better understanding of who the author of the story is. So let me pray before we get into the story. Oh God, we do thank you that you who are um, so big and awesome and unknowable have made yourself known to us, that we can open this Bible, your words, and actually read the words that were spoken from your mouth, read the words spoken from Jesus' mouth. God, we pray that we will be changed by these words, that we won't just walk out of here um, feeling a little better or feeling a little happier today, but that they will change us, that the words that you have spoken will impact our lives and impact the way we live each day. So God, we thank you that we can read these words. I pray that your spirit will be here this morning speaking through the words, through my mouth, um, that you will open ears and you'll open hearts to receive the message you have for us today. And we pray all this in Jesus' powerful name. Amen. Okay, so this um, parable of the Good Samaritan, it's only found in one of the four Gospels. It's found in the Gospel of Luke. Um, and in chapter 10, uh, verse 25, we're introduced to two people uh, that are starting a conversation. So um, Luke 10, 25 says, One day an expert in religious law stood up to test Jesus by asking him this question. Teacher, what should I do to inherit eternal life? So we have two people, Jesus and this expert in religious law. And if you've read through the Gospels, you will know that whenever there is somebody around who has expertise in religious law, they're usually up to no good. Um, and actually in this, we, we know that he's up to no good because it says he, he stood up to test Jesus. And so even though his question was a really good question, you know, how can I inherit eternal life? And even though that question was being asked of the right person. Like, who better to ask that question to than Jesus himself? Um, his intention, the intent behind this question was not good. He wasn't actually wanting to learn. What he was wanting to do is trap Jesus uh, or make him look foolish or at, at worst to, to kind of trap him in a place where he's committed a crime. Um, so he asked this question with these um, bad motives, and Jesus answers him not with a straight answer, but with a question 
back. He says, okay, what does the law of Moses say? How do you read it? So you are obviously an expert in the law. So instead of me telling you, you tell me what you see in Scripture. What do you read when you read the law? And so the man responds by saying, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul, all your strength and all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. So here, um, this expert in the law is actually quoting two different portions of the law. And in the book of Matthew, Jesus actually quotes the same two portions and then says that these two together summarize the entirety of the law. So Jesus is like, well done, yes, that is correct. Go do this and you will live. You go, ah, good job, but wait, that's not right. If you went upstairs right now and you asked um, the kids upstairs what the answer to this question is, they're not going to tell you, love the Lord your God and love your neighbor as yourself. They are going to say Jesus, because that's how they respond to every question, but also because that is the correct answer, right? You look at um, passages like Ephesians 2.9 that says, salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done, so none of us can boast about it. Um, or Acts 16.31 that says, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. Jesus made it clear over and over and over again that there was only one way to gain salvation, and that was through faith in him. So why did he answer this man by saying, yes, you are correct. Love God, love others, and you can inherit eternal life. Well, luckily, the man wasn't satisfied with this answer, so he pushes a little further, and he says to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Now, right before that, it says the man wanted to justify his actions. So when he said this, posed this question, it wasn't um, said to uh, learn. He wasn't interested <clears throat> in changing what he did. What he wanted to do was um, get Jesus to tell him that he had done everything necessary in order to inherit eternal life, that no one could ever challenge it on this. He had loved the right people the right way, and so he should inherit eternal life. And so you can just hear in this question, and who is my neighbor? This, like, arrogance and, and self-righteousness. And if I were Jesus, I would have just, like, walked away. Who needs you? But he doesn't do that. Jesus is so patient with this man and his question. And he replies with a story, the parable of the Good Samaritan. So he starts and says, A Jewish man was traveling from Jerusalem down to Jericho, and he was attacked by bandits. They stripped him of his clothes, they beat him up, and left him half dead beside the road. By chance, a priest came along. But when he saw the man lying there, he crossed to the other side of the road and passed him by. A temple assistant walked over and looked at him lying there, but he also passed by on the other side. And so Jesus, he starts telling this dramatic story. That starts up with a man being beat up, and he's stripped of his clothes. He's thrown to the side of the road, and he's in such bad shape that he is completely helpless. He is completely dependent on the compassion of some stranger walking by. And so maybe the, um, the, the first people who were listening to this story, maybe they, they were concerned. Oh, nobody, maybe nobody's going to come. Maybe this half-dead man is soon going to be fully dead. But wait, somebody appears, and it's not just anybody, it's a priest, one who knows the law so well, one who knows that he is supposed to love his neighbor. Surely this man will stop and help this poor man. But it doesn't happen that way. Instead, the priest does see the man lying on the side of the road, but he just walks on by. Not only walks on by, he goes to the other side of the road and walks on by. And before you judge him too harshly, because this is a made-up story, um, maybe this man, this priest, was actually on his way to help somebody else in a worse position. Maybe <clears throat> this wasn't a reflection of his heart. Maybe it's a reflection of the reality that he just can't help everybody, right? Or maybe he um, had just been helping somebody, and he was so physically and mentally exhausted that, you know what, it was for his own self-care 
for his own health that he had to just pass this one by. I'm not sure why he walked on by. Jesus doesn't tell us, but the fact is, he did. This priest walked on past this poor man lying on the side. And so this man probably thought, there was my last hope going into the distance. But a miracle happens, and somebody else appears. And this guy, he's not a priest, but he's a temple assistant. And so he may not have known the law as well as the priest, but surely he's familiar with it. And that means he knows that he's supposed to love his neighbor. So, oh, this guy will stop. But no, the same thing happens. He crosses over to the other side of the road and walks on past, leaving this poor man sitting there. And so these two men who were representatives of the law, the system that was in place in order to bring people into right relationship with God, they had both failed. They had failed to keep the law. They had failed to love their neighbor. And so it seems like all hope is lost. But Jesus continues the story. He says, Then a despised Samaritan came along, and when he saw the man, he felt compassion for him. Going over to him, the Samaritan soothed his wounds with olive oil and wine and bandaged them. And then he put the man on his own donkey and took him to an inn where he took care of him. The next day, he handed the innkeeper two silver coins, telling him, Take care of this man. If his bill runs higher than this, I'll pay you the next time I'm here. So to fully appreciate this story, we have to understand the relationship between the Jewish people and Samaritans, between the man lying on the side of the road and the man that's coming towards him. And this passage shows you quite clearly the despised Samaritan, right? That is how the Jews viewed Samaritans. They were despised, and this, this hatred for Samaritans was so ingrained in the minds of the Jewish people that they, they just didn't question it. Um, I was teaching a um, age three and four class years back. This may seem like a random story, but it really does connect. Um, and during, on one of these um, nights that I was uh, teaching this class, there, something very dramatic happened. And um, Emily did something to Caleb that made him very, very angry. And I watched this three-year-old boy just rack his brain to come up with the meanest thing he could say to Emily in order to communicate exactly how upset he was at her. And so it didn't matter what I said. It wasn't going to stop him. And I watched him lift his fist, and he said, you're dead, and he popped her on the top of the head. And anyway, that was shocking to all of us, I think. But... Um, this statement, you're dead, it wasn't said as a threat. He wasn't saying, I'm going to kill you. He had racked his brain to think of the meanest statement he could say in order to inflict the most pain. So it, it was worse. Your dead was worse than you're ugly or you're stupid. It was you're dead. The worst thing a three-year-old could say, right? And that's what it was like to call someone a Samaritan, right? You Samaritan, you're dead. If you wanted to inflict pain, if you wanted to show just how little you thought of somebody, you call them a Samaritan. And so Jesus chooses a despised Samaritan to be the third person to walk down this road and see the man lying on the side of the road. And so based on the way the Jews viewed and treated Samaritans, I don't think anyone would have blamed the Samaritan for simply walking past this man. Right? He had been shown nothing but disdain by men like him. So why couldn't he just walk on by? But that's not what happened. The passage says that he felt compassion. He sees the Samaritan, and he feels uh, the Jewish man on the side of the road, and he feels compassion. He feels compassion. Like, how is that possible? How could he feel compassion for someone who has treated him so unfairly? And if not for his sake, this, this man and what he represents has treated his loved one, his, his family, so unfairly. Like, wouldn't he be justified in feeling just a little bit of satisfaction? Maybe mumbling under his breath, like, Sirs, you right, you meanie. Like, I cannot understand how his first gut reaction would have been compassion. 
But that's the story Jesus told. This man, the Samaritan man, walks past, sees a Jewish man lying on, this, on the road, and he feels compassion. And then this compassion leads him to stop. And he, using his own supplies, he, he cleanses his wounds, he sanitizes his wounds, and then he binds them and lifts the man onto his own donkey. And then he takes him to an inn. And he doesn't just drop him off there. He gets, uh, goes into the inn with him, and he spends the night with him, caring for him. And then the next morning, he goes to the innkeeper, and he gives him some money, and he says, I want you to continue caring for this man. And this money should cover it. And so he gives him two coins um, that's worth two days' wages, and it's debated, but that, that could have covered anywhere from two weeks to two months of care at this inn. He went, okay, this is getting, like, too much, too much. Um, and it doesn't even stop there. <laughs> then he says to the innkeeper, so use this, but use whatever you need. If, if you require more than these two coins, that's okay. You spend whatever is necessary, and I promise I'll come back and reimburse you. And so we're reaching new heights. Like, this is ridiculous. He is um, showing love and compassion in a way that's unwise, and it's almost uncomfortable, right? This is this stranger. This is your enemy. Like, what, what are you trying to get out of this? But Jesus finishes his parable, and he turns um, to the expert in the law, and he asks this question. Now, which of these three would you say was a neighbor to the man who was attacked by bandits? Was it the, one of the two men who represented the law? who knew it so well, who have maybe have felt so much pride because they had kept the law so well? Or was it the despised Samaritan? And the expert in the law, he, he couldn't answer any way except for this way. The one who showed mercy. This man, this expert in the law, he had completely failed. He had failed in his attempt to trap Jesus, but he also had failed in his attempt to justify his own actions, right? Did you notice that Jesus didn't even answer his question? He had asked, who's my neighbor? And Jesus had replied with the answer to a different question, the question of what does being a neighbor who loves looks like? This expert had been so focused on determining who he was required to love and who he didn't have to love that he had missed the whole point of what does that love actually look like? And then Jesus laid it out very clearly for him. This love is extravagant. It's lavish. It's unbiased. That is the love of a neighbor. If you love like that, you will inherit eternal life. So let's make it personal. Do you love your neighbor like that? Have you ever loved your neighbor like that? I honestly don't think I have. But I'm certain that there is somebody here, a few people here who have, because I know this is a very loving church. But even if we, like, collected the most loving people of the bunch, that is not how you live every day. You do not love everybody that way. You do not care for everybody you meet that way. So I'm so sorry to tell you all but none of you are going to inherit eternal life. Let's pray. <laughs> no. <laughs> That's not how it can end, right? <laughs> but it does end that way. We don't actually know how this expert in the law replied. We never see him again. So now is the really fun part, because now we just get to imagine what happened. Um, and I can see it going one of two ways. First, I think this expert in the law could have walked away sad. There's another story that we find um, in Scripture. Luke actually describes it in a few chapters about a, a very wealthy man who comes to Jesus and asks the exact same question of, how can I inher inherit eternal life? And Jesus explains to him what's required, um, and the man walks away sad because he realizes he can't do that. And so maybe this man, this expert in the law, did the same thing. Maybe he heard what was required of him and went, I can't do that, and he walked away discouraged and frustrated. But maybe it ended a different way. 
Maybe instead of walking away sad, this expert in the law, he heard the story and uh, fell to his knees in front of Jesus and said, there must be another way. There has to be another way because I can't do that. I can't love so unconditionally. I cannot love so extravagantly Jesus. There must be another way. And then maybe Jesus would have replied, yes, there is another way. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. This man, in his striving, in his um, desire to justify himself, he was missing out on the gift that was right in front of him. This extravagant, lavish love that was expected of him, it was also the love that was being offered to him. And he was so caught up in answering the question of who is my neighbor and justifying whether or not he was allowed to get into eternal life that he missed out on who was standing right in front of him. You see, Jesus is the only one who has ever or will ever love like the Good Samaritan. In um, Isaiah 53.3, it says, He was despised and rejected, a man of sorrows acquainted with deepest grief. We turned our backs on him, and he looked the other way. And looked the other way. He was despised, and we did not care. Jesus was despised by mankind. We turned our backs. We hated him. And yet, he demonstrated a love like no other. He didn't just give of his time and of his resources, of his donkey. <laughs> he gave his very life so that we could have life and life eternal. Um, Romans 8, 3 to 4 says, The law of Moses was unable to save us because of the weakness of our sinful nature. So God did what the law could not do. He sent his own son in a body just like the bodies we sinners have. And in that body, God declared an end to sin's control over us by giving his son as a sacrifice for our sins. He did this so that the just requirements of the law would be fully satisfied for us, who no longer follow our sinful nature, but instead follow the Spirit. See, we were and we are undeserving of the love that God has offered us. God saw us lying half dead in our sin on the side of the road, and he showed us mercy. He was not obligated to stop and care, but he did. He stopped, and he picked us up, and he cared for our wounds, and he showed us this, this deep, lavish love and compassion. And so Jesus, as he talks to this expert in the law, he was offering him a gift that was extremely uncomfortable for him. He was offering him the truth that he was inadequate, that he was insufficient, that there was no way he could ever inherit eternal life on his own. And he wasn't telling this man this expert in the law, to feel guilty for this. He wasn't saying, you should be loving better. You should be showing more compassion. And that's not how we're supposed to see it today either. We're not supposed to be going, man, I don't love like that. Shame on me. Oh my goodness, I feel terrible. No. What Jesus wanted, the response he wanted from this man and the response he wants from us is not guilt, but humility. Surrender. True Christ-like compassion requires humility. It's only when we recognize our need for God's compassion for his love that we can ever even attempt to show that love and compassion to others. Because it's not our job to determine who's deserving of compassion, right? 
We don't get to decide if somebody's worked hard enough, is in the right place to receive compassion. Because who are we to have received compassion? No, we shouldn't be trying to answer the question of who is my neighbor, but rather, oh God, how can I show love like you have shown me to those around me, to my neighbors? And so we don't love, we don't give, we don't defend or advocate um, for any other reason than the people that are around us, the people we find lying on the side of the road, they are created by God. They are deeply, extravagantly, lavishly loved by their God and Creator just like we are, just like you are. And so we're not asked even to love our enemies because they're deserving of it. Probably they're not deserving of it. But we're asked to love our enemies because that's exactly what Jesus did. He loved me, his enemy. And so compassion that's shown with humility is compassion that's that's fueled by, but is also pointing to God. And so um, he's our source, but he's also the objective of compassion. We want people to see our compassionate God through the way we show compassion. And so I know Christians do not have a corner on compassion. (laughs) There are lots of loving, compassionate people out there who do not say Jesus is Lord. But what we have, the privilege we have, is finding our source of compassion, the source for compassion, in the one who has shown ultimate compassion. And then we get to actually go out and represent that. We get to represent Jesus as we love and show compassion to others. So this is, this is far greater than just showing kindness. Like, this is God's heart, a piece of God's heart that's been given to us so that we can go out and share that with the people around us. So what does that mean for us today, right here, right now? Well, there may be some of you here today who are still struggling just to accept the lavish love and compassion that God is offering you. You may fully understand the saving work of Jesus on the cross. Like, you may know everything that it says in Scripture about what Jesus has done, but you are still striving to earn eternal life on your own. You you think, if I can just love a little better, if I can just show a bit more compassion, then I'm going to be deserving of eternal life, of salvation. But let me tell you, like that poor expert in the law, there is no amount of striving, no amount of justifying that will ever be enough. And... I know this is an uncomfortable truth. It's an uncomfortable gift. But you are insufficient. (laughs) But Jesus is more than sufficient. He has done everything that is needed to be done for you to be reconciled with God. He has done it. And he offers you eternal life. So cease striving. If you're here today, though, and you're like, I know that God loves me. I get it. I don't need this reminder. But there's this disconnect. You know God loves you, but when you go into the world, you don't want to, but you just can give a reason why this person and this person and this person just is not deserving of my time and energy and compassion. Don't walk out of fear today feeling guilty. I don't believe that that is Jesus' heart. That, that was Jesus' intent when telling this story. My prayer is that you will go out of here with a renewed sense of awe for God's love for you, but also humility, recognizing that it is nothing you have done to deserve that love, that it was freely given to you. So for all of us, I pray that we will have um, God's eyes. (laughs) That when we look at the people around us, we will see them the way 
God sees them, that we will be able to love them the way that God loves them. And that we can change the question around, that we can stop asking, who is my neighbor? But rather, God, how can I love my neighbor in that deep, lavish, extravagant way that you have loved me? Because Jesus, the true good Samaritan, he wants to use you. He wants to use your insufficiencies. He wants to use your brokenness. He wants to use you just as you are to not only highlight his amazing mercy and compassion, but also to go out into this world and reflect his love and compassion to all those that you come in contact with. So let me pray. Oh God, we are so in awe. We are so grateful for the love and compassion that you have shown us. That you would send your son Jesus to not just um, be amongst the people he created to live in this broken world, but that you would send him to die, die in our place so that we might live. Oh God, today in this moment, may you just um, make that so fresh and real for us. May we be overwhelmed to the point of feeling uncomfortable at the amount of love that you have offered us, the amount of compassion you have for us. God, may it not stop there. May this love and compassion fuel us to go out this week and to love deeply and extravagantly, to show unbiased compassion to the world around us. And may it be more than just for the sake of being nice, but God, through that, may you be revealing yourself to people. May your kingdom grow because we are reflecting you. Thank you that this isn't just wishful thinking, but that this is actually what you do. This is what you want to do through us this week. So give us boldness. Give us your heart. Give us your eyes to see those people lying on the side of the road.